and welcome to US Digi360. I'm Dilbar Shatterson and today I'm coming to you from the Midwest. Right now I'm here in sunny Kentucky by Pambo Lake where you can see the Appalachian region in full bloom. But don't be fooled by its looks. It's unassuming towns like this that can be most vulnerable to disaster. States in the Midwest, like Kentucky here, are located far from oceans and so according to a report from the Midwestern Regional Climate Center, they experience wide extremes of both temperature and precipitation that occur over days, weeks, months and years. So with hot and humid summers and very cold and snowy winters, it's here where the elements collide to stir up trouble, and as you'll note today, quite often. So when they do happen, how can residents regain normalcy after the immediate threat of danger is through? Let's meet Chung Xie, a volunteer who's from Tsiji's Midwest Regional Office who can tell us more about what it means to help neighbors in need. I'm Chong Xie, I joined Tsiji in 1997. Back in 2007, there's a flood in Minnesota. That is the first uh, disaster we have to deal with. We talked to the Red Cross, we talked to the city, nobody wants to talk to us. And then uh, we are lucky, we talked to an uh, EMA director of the county, but this still suspicious. That is the challenge in the beginning what we face. But gradually, um, we respond to a lot of uh, disaster. We had about 35 disaster relief in Midwest alone for the past seven years. The major one, the largest scale one is the Cedar Rapid Flood. We help about 3,800 families over there. The entire city of Cedar Rapid got flooded. Yes, that's the first a disaster relief in Midwest works side by side with the uh, American Red Cross. Every morning, there are hundreds of people lined up in the mall. I was so touched the whole mall. And when uh, the volunteer walked in, and, uh, all the, our clients like, clap on it and uh, the welcome us. Another one is basically like uh, Japan, Missouri. That is an uh, EF5 tornado and wiped through the Japan. City, the whole city just wiped out. There are about 158 people dying, and uh, 1,500 houses got destroyed. The, all those uh, survivors don't have any place to go and don't have any food to eat, so we prepared a hot meal for them. We're not gonna die. To M, it's far away still. 2012, we have a tornado go from uh, Missouri to Illinois to Indiana to Kentucky to Ohio all the way. A lot of disaster is happen in the remote country area. And they're very conservative and they're very religious. But uh, over these years, gradually, the word spread out. People not only know us, they also trust us. They also expect us such as the last year in uh, November 17, when the tornado wiped out the city of Washington, Illinois. They know how to see do the disaster relief. Instead of just uh, one table, they give us a big uh, space for us to do the distribution. So you keep doing what you're doing, a good thing. People recognize you. A lot of the, the survivors, they told us, the cash you give to us is good, help a lot, very helpful. However, the most important thing, the most valuable thing we give to them is the love and the care. We hope they are not disaster anymore in the Midwest. But as long as there's a disaster, the nearest will be there. While Midwest Siji volunteers are busy lending a hand here across this vast region, they've also dipped their toes into the ponds here in Jackson, Kentucky. And it's with this state that in 1964, President Lyndon B. Johnson declared an initiative famously known as the War on Poverty. His goal? To help Americans rise above the poverty line. But why choose Kentucky as the face of his campaign? At the time, it contained a few of the nation's most impoverished counties, and even today, Breathitt County, which includes Jackson, is still no exception. It's here where salary per person is estimated at roughly 15,500 per household, according to the U.S. Census Bureau. That's about $13,000 less than the national average of 28K. Moreover, Spotlight on Poverty and Opportunity has assessed Kentucky's overall poverty rate at 19.4%. That's almost one in five residents. So as an area that has had a long history of tough times, how much hope is left when that same area gets slammed with natural disaster? Let's go learn more about how residents here have stayed afloat in Eastern Kentucky. Uh, Jackson itself, 
was originally called Breathitt Town. It was created in 1843. And it really is a hub of economic development in Eastern Kentucky for many, many years until the railroad moved farther south and then the coal industry, the timber industry moved with the railroad. It's a small town in Eastern Kentucky. Uh, we're surrounded by the Kentucky River. This is an impoverished area. There's not a lot of jobs. We're still a little old fashioned in the sense that we care about our neighbors. Uh, we know everybody. Poverty in Eastern Kentucky is the result of a lot of factors. Jackson and Breathitt County have really always been there. At one point, uh, most recently in the 2010 census, we were the third poorest county in the United States. And, and to be honest, most of Eastern Kentucky has had a long history of flooding. And there are many, many factors that, that play into that. Uh, the terrain itself is steep, it's rocky. There's not a lot of uh, topsoil coverage on a lot of these areas. So anything that falls in the mountains tends to run off at a rapid rate. Specifically, the 09 flood is the biggest thing that's happened uh, in the last five years. It was very devastating to the entire city and county. I think the estimate was somewhere around 44% of the county was affected by the flood. Hundreds and hundreds of homes were lost. At the time, I was the vice mayor, and I was also the director of the Red Cross for this area and I spent uh, six weeks out in the field as uh, a Red Cross volunteer, helping feed and clothe, get them fresh water, find them a place to stay. You know what, help them wash the dishes. We were actually over at Lake Cumberland. Um, my parents have a lake house over there, and my friends had called me to tell me that um, the water was getting close to our home. And then we got back that night, and the water was still up, and it was, completely covered. It was about halfway up into the trailer. The next day, we went in and it was just, completely, everything that was there was destroyed. I was spending the night at my sister's house and I'm told that my home just lifted up and washed away. It had never gotten that deep before. What am I gonna do? Where am I gonna live? Where am I gonna go? So that was kinda what first ran through my head when I first saw it. I had to live with mom and dad for about a year until I could get this place uh, to save up enough money to, to get it. These are all um, pictures that were down in the, when the flood happened. So it would it would have been hard to lose um, the pictures of the kids as they as they grew up. I lost everything I had accumulated over my entire working life, books and encyclopedias and pictures of colleagues and so forth, and that's all gone and gone forever. This is a replacement document. It was nicely framed and matted, the one that washed away, but it looked just like this. A lot of people had to move away from here to find a place to live. That was the biggest change, the lack of homes. Uh, the last uh, census that was taken uh, showed that we have dropped tremendously as far as population. The flood has been long lasting. It happened in an instant, and five years later, we still have the effects of it. This is the Kentucky River. It's the North Fork of the Kentucky River. She's a beautiful river, but she can be dangerous. One of the Red Cross volunteers that was assigned to assist me here in Breathitt County had worked with Sue Chi before. She made a few phone calls and we were so glad to see Sue Chi arrive. They were definitely a blessing because we were almost at the end of uh, our ropes. We didn't know what else to do. There was just so much disaster and so many people needing help. And Sue Chi filled that gap. We felt that uh, they were genuine, and the feelings they were having were true and heartfelt. They actually cared about our people. And together between the Red Cross and Sue Chi, uh, we were able to help these families eat, uh, find a place to stay, put clothes on their back and stuff before the federal government finally stepped in and started helping as far as finding a place to live. So it, it's volunteers that are the lifeline. It truly is. Since we came here in 2009, 
we, our volunteer, had the feeling that we make good friends here. We had the feeling we will come back to see our friends here. We get a message from Red Cross and uh, they want us to come to help. Before the flood, they are already in not in very good shape, but they are struggle with their life. And on top of this, they got nothing. So this is very special to me. So after that, uh, we do the relief, I have been thinking about them all the time, especially the mayor. She's very compassionate. She really uh, care and love and take care of the, the people. Our master Ching Yen want us to inspire the people. And everybody come to me, say appreciate, say thank you, say they, they really got to see us. Because we come back, we show our caring love, $100 money order. They show about our care. So I told them money is not that much, but love is a counter. This is a travel check. So you can use it, write your name here, and you can cash anywhere. Thank you. Okay, thank you. With the cash card, um, I got cleaning supplies, um, paper towels, dishes, shoes, underwear, anything, anything that I needed, because basically everything I had was uh, destroyed. For them to come that far and to help people that they don't even know, um, it was just, it was amazing. It really was. I was very gracious you all to come back and, and, and see how we were doing and um, to help us out again. It was just wonderful. Su Chi were the first uh, people that, that gave me any direct help. I did not have anything at all. I didn't even have toiletries. I had no clothes. I was totally destitute of everything. You came out today to say thank you to Su Chi for what they did for us. Our people here are a proud people. We're used to hard times. We're used to overcoming. And somebody came to us and didn't offer us charity. They offered us a helping hand. And you all fulfilled every need that was needed here. They gave me that $500 gift card. And I used that to buy the most essential elements. And I thank God for them, and I thank them for the love of human beings, mankind, that they showed by coming here to help us when that disaster happened. God bless you. Thank you. Though Jackson is seeing some relief for now, there's still a lot of progress to be made in this neck of the woods. Yet with residents as resilient and determined as they are here in Jackson, it brings to mind a jinx of aphorism that goes, continue even when it is hard to go on, continue when it is hard to let go, and endure even when it is hard to bear. It's that spirit that grows among its people, but not to mention its volunteers. So let's see where else they brought their mission of disaster relief across the Midwest. While its French namesake is famously known as the largest port city in France, I'm here now in the not-so-French Marseilles in Illinois to see how this community, too, has fared in these waters. Even though everything here at the Illinois River seems like business as usual, a very unusual event happened here last April. The National Weather Service reports that this river was in the midst of record flooding. At the same time, nine barges were being tugged across the river by small boats. These barges are massive flatboats that carry goods and materials via waterways like the kind you see here. And suddenly, those barges broke free from the tugboats. And while most of them sank, at least three barges stayed afloat and crashed into the dam you see behind me. The result of all this? Uncontrollable gushing of water. And it's this catastrophic happening that took its residents completely by surprise. And for many, it left them with only minutes to make a move. And though the city claimed no death toll, it did take a toll on just about everything else. Take a look. Uh, I was working from home that day and uh, we got a couple of emergency alerts regarding the rain. We went to my sister's house and then we saw the news and that's when we saw our house actually on the news with uh, water up to the windows. We all went different places and stayed with different uh, friends. We stood at the banks of the flood for about four days wondering if our house got flooded. 
Uh, we had about 11 feet of water there. We had seven feet in the basement and uh, four feet upstairs. When the flood came, it took about everything away that we owned. The river now looks very, very calm, but it was a far different picture on April 18th of last year. Now, our residents really weren't all that concerned. There was a possibility of probably some flooding in some basements. We weren't able to get back into our homes until three days later. You know, after the flood hit, it was more of a waiting game. So, you know, that makes everyone really anxious. It was pretty overwhelming when we walked in because we had a kind of three of us push our way through the doors because everything in the house was scattered around and we didn't actually see the water in the house when we came in. It was about a half inch layer of mud over everything. I think we were out of the house for probably about maybe three months. Myself and, and our younger son, we ended up at one friend's house. I think we stayed there maybe two weeks. With him being autistic, people don't always understand his quirkiness, I suppose. So we thought it was best if we, if we found another place to stay. What I had to do to keep the peace with friends and to keep, you know, Riley uh, as stress-free as I could. I was homeless for a while there, and we had no money, and it was very hard to actually survive to even get back into here. And then when we came back in here to see what actually happened was pretty much heart-wrenching. All of their pictures are gone, so it just kind of makes you sit there and think. Should have grabbed more stuff. A lot of people that I knew actually quit their jobs to rebuild their homes. So they had a you know significant financial needs. Well over, I think I think the number is around 1,200 people actually had to leave their homes. Okay, now about 25% of them were able to get back relatively quickly. And now we're at 66% back. Uh, well, my husband's been laid off and even he usually gets called back um, the end of spring when the kids get out of school. And last year, that's about when we started, you know, we really got into cleaning up the house. So he didn't work, but maybe two days last year. So it's been tough. I'm on disability and uh, the wife, she broke her leg. And so she's not working, so we don't have any income from coming from that. Uh, FEMA gave us the maximum. I believe that was 31000 And that's nowhere near enough to repair the whole home, no. But this was all flooded in here. Uh, the floors were all gone. And uh, basically, I put this whole, well, this whole floor here I put in myself. This is it here. I mean, it's still not uh, all done yet. We're still working on it, and so it's gonna take some time to get everything done. But at least it's functional where we're not homeless now, we're back in our home, you know? The scope of the damage from immediately after the flood, in my opinion, was just bulldoze it over and we'll build a new house. But Steve was very hopeful and he was very confident. So I went with his opinion and he rebuilt from the foundation up. I mainly do remodeling. It was pretty hard, especially when I was here by myself, trying to get things done. Kent helped out getting all the volunteers, you know, coordinated when they were coming in and going to people's houses, and so they were tremendous helps. If a crew's here, okay, then, then we work every single day with the crew. Especially at the beginning, almost every day, I had emails, so I would come home in the evening and have, I'd have to work until 10 o'clock at night Tushi came in at a wonderful time because our, our residents were really staggered by that time. Our director asked me to take the uh, Chong and Yume through our city. And uh, so they came and I, I showed them the city, showed them the homes, we visited residents. The volunteers from Suchi took time with each of the groups, okay, with each of the families. You know, and I, I had the families tell me, oh, they were so nice, that's really what I needed right then. They were wonderful. Ken Terry is my uh, good friend. He's uh, so nice and so compassionate and a uh, great heart for this community. 
And uh, so he's our county person and uh, he know every family, so who need exactly what help. So we come here, give them uh, like uh, um, the baby car, the cash car. We help about 160 families here the first time we were here. The first card we got was the very beginning. I believe we used that to replace some of the items the kids lost, like their clothes, a couple toys. We were traveling a lot more than what we normally do, so our, as far as our monthly budget went uh, for gas, it really made a big difference for us because it freed up um, our cash to be able to uh, replace some of the more personal effects that we had lost that we needed right away. That really came out handy for the times that we were homeless and stuff. It, it, it helped out with a lot of the bills that we needed to get paid, a lot of the gas money that we needed to get around in. The second distribution, we come here uh, on March 29, 2014. We invite uh, over 100 families, but actually 85 families show up. So that is real good. Uh, most of the houses are recovered. They, um, they move in, but there's still a lot of houses uh, still. Uh, need a lot of repair. So we we'll continue to monitor, we we'll still continue to work with the Kent. If anybody, any family still need help, we we'll still will provide the financial assistance. When you guys came back, um, my husband and I were just so overwhelmed with appreciation because at the time we were getting at the end of our monthly budget. So I mean the extra money really, really helped us out. And we were so happy because I don't think that uh, we're forgotten, but I think people don't realize how long the process is from recovering. They were all very friendly. They all very sympathetic to our needs. Matter of fact, I used one of the blankets there when I was homeless that they gave me the first time that we met with them. And I used that actually, and that uh, kept me not only warm, but it, it, it kept my spirits up knowing that someone was so helpful like that. We have to give it to people who don't have that much money. Do you think we have $10, maybe? 800 800 whoa. That would be nice to give to somebody, wouldn't it? I don't think words can express the amount of gratitude that you guys offer us. I mean, there's just, in such hard times, it's just heartwarming and very appreciative. Hello, Steve. Hey, Steve. There are lots of mud, and, uh, all this drywall, all rebuilt, right? Yeah, we took it all the wall. Took all the wall, and so. You did it. Yeah, we took everything out. So, everything back to normal now. Pretty much as Pretty normal much. as it can get. <laughs> <laughs> Though the residents of Marseilles had no way of knowing about an oncoming flood, this essentially is the nature of disaster. If we don't prepare for them, it's we who make ourselves quite vulnerable. But if we do, how do we live without the bug of fear creeping up on us? Many of the families you met today face this conflict every day, but as they show us how they balance the two, they also show us how they've mustered an incredible strength. I want to thank all the residents and families of Jackson and Marseilles for sharing their stories with us and for helping us learn what it means to keep on going and doing. Thanks for joining me. I'm Dilbar Shatterson from Marseilles, Illinois. I'll see you soon.